So joining our series on this episode are Mick Power, AM and Scott Power, the father-son duo behind one of Australia's largest and most successful privately owned urban development and construction firms, the BMD Group. Gentlemen, pleasure having the opportunity to share your story and, and the journey of the BMD Group. Mick, we'll get into, as I said, the journey of the company, but first I want to sort of get into your background and, and your story, if we could. Talk us through your upbringing in, in Queensland and perhaps a little bit about your family's history. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm uh, the youngest of uh, three children and uh, uh, we were born and raised, I guess, in, in the uh, bayside suburbs of Winner Manly. Uh, my parents were from the uh, Newstead Breakfast Creek area of Brisbane. Uh, and uh, that's where they met. Uh, Dad had, um, had uh, left school at, at 14, um, where he was uh, kept at school, I guess, by the teachers because he was a very good footballer and he played for Queensland in the, uh, um, in the Queensland Schoolboys Rugby League team. So I think he spent most of his days counting the nails on the fence rather than at school. So he, he, left, uh, he left school and joined General Motors and, uh, and spent 44 years there. When he retired, he was the longest serving employee of General Motors uh, uh, in Australia. Um, Mum was the, uh, was the uh, homemaker and disciplinarian and Dad was, uh, was very much, um, you know, the, uh, the hard worker. And, uh, someone that I've always been very, very proud of. Um, mum and Dad, mum and Dad uh, rented a house at Wynnum on the, on the beachfront, right opposite the wading pool, lovely place to, to grow up. And uh, uh, Dad, Dad used to uh, catch the bus. There was a local bus that went into, uh, uh, into the valley area of Brisbane. Uh, from there he'd walk down to, uh, to General Motors, which was in Wickham Street, probably about a kilometre. So he never owned a, a car, even though he worked for General Motors. Uh, he never owned his own car until 1962. And, uh, but he used to get trade-plated cars that he'd bring home uh, on occasion. But, uh, you know, very, uh, very humble man, very hard-working, and uh, uh, I guess... Um, uh, we felt like we were very rich, but in reality we weren't. And, but uh, Dad and Mum always made us feel uh, very special, and I was certainly spoilt rotten, and uh, uh, and always felt I could uh, had the support of the family. Now, as I understand it, you attended Wynnum Central State School and spent most of your upbringing in the outdoors, swimming in the bay, and, and fishing with siblings. What do you recall most fondly? of that period of, of the early stage of your life? Well, as I said, I was, I was very, very, very um, lucky. I had a, I had a wonderful uh, childhood. Uh, I freely admit that. Uh, my grandparents also lived with us, which was very kind of dad when you think about that in these terms today. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I always felt like the sky was the limit. Um, Mum and Dad were very supportive of of, uh, of me, in, particularly in the football endeavours and uh, uh, playing for the district. Uh, they they take me to football every uh, every weekend during the season, and uh, and my mates with them. Um, so um, you know, I obviously remember those times very fondly um, because Dad was such a uh, you know a, a sort of um, uh, keen sportsman himself. Um, it sort of rubbed off very much on me and uh, uh, I think it's rubbed off on, on Scott and, and everybody else as, uh, as you go down the line. Hmm. And then in terms of study, you enrolled in an engineering degree and then studied part-time for around about six years or so, uh, during which time employment uh, opportunities took precedence. What, were you, what, what motivated you to, to pursue engineering? I actually started in architecture. Um, I, uh, I graduated school 
1967. I'd like to say much that I, I did it twice, the, uh, the senior year, but uh, mum had sent me to school a year early because I, I must have been a bit of a pain, and so I was the youngest in the grade. Uh, so it gave me the opportunity to, uh, to do that final year and also captain the football team, which was probably my major priority. Um, so yeah, we did the uh, uh, we did senior in 1967. Uh, I matriculated and uh, and thought I wanted to be a an architect because I, I was always pretty good with the uh, handwriting and the drawing. Uh, so I started architecture. Uh, the first year, I think you did four subjects, and you had to have employment in a in a uh, drawing office uh, during that first year. Uh, so I started, I did four subjects, I passed one, which was building and construction. So that sort of gave me a message and I'd, I'd secured work with a air conditioning uh, company called J.R. Wiley and uh, they asked me to change to engineering, mechanical engineering, which I was able to do. And, uh, but you don't have to choose your path until second year. So. So I started, the year I started with them, 1968, uh, I changed from architecture to uh, engineering. And uh, I was about 12 months with them. And my brother-in-law, uh, Bevan, who was the B in, uh, with my sister B in BMD, um, he was working for Leighton's. Uh, he'd been on the Gold Coast on, uh, on the excavators, building the rock walls and things down there. And he, uh, they put him into the, plant workshop and uh, Leighton's had only been in Queensland for five months and uh, they were uh, uh, out at Reginald Street, Rock Lee and he overheard the boss saying that they were going to put on a cadet so he threw my hat in the ring. Uh, they only interviewed, interviewed one person, that was me and uh, I started with them in, uh, in uh, January 1969. And if I recall correctly, you spent around about 10 years or so from 69 to 79 with, with Leeton Holdings. What were some of the projects that you were working on over that period? Uh, well, at the start, uh, it was um, a very exciting period because it was, uh, uh, they were rolling out what was called the Wilbur Smith plan, which Scott would have heard of in, in his engineering days at school. I'm sure he was an American planner. So uh, part of that plan was... Uh, uh, the Kemp Place Tunnel, uh, the Riverside Expressway, South East Freeway, and a lot of other major corridors, right? So I was uh, fortunate that I was put straight into the estimating section right outside the boss's office uh, and thrown into work with, uh, with people that were, I didn't know at the time, but were legends in the industry. Uh, an Irish estimator called Pat Burns uh, took me under his wing and uh, so I was working on a lot of those tenders uh, for these big projects and uh, a lot of them came out around Christmas. So um, I worked through Christmas, didn't like it at first, but realised, uh, you know, it had to be done. And, uh, and uh, Leighton's always rewarded you. I think I started off on sort of 20 bucks a week and within three months I was on 50 bucks a week so, and a car allowance and free petrol. So... You know, it was pretty good times, but um, um, that's how I got the job at Leighton's and uh, um, I then just changed simply to the civil and uh, focused on the civil uh, engineering. And then so two years later, you married your wife, Denise, in 1971 and you both started your own family with Dare, born in 1972, Scott in 1974 and Hayley in 1977. Talk us through that period. So you're working full time at Leeton's. You started your own family. As I understand it, you were travelling a fair bit throughout Queensland as well. Just as a precursor to the launch of the BMD Group, walk us through some of those years there, if you could. Yeah, well, they were uh, uh, very interesting times. Um, uh, in 19, uh, as I said, I, I started in 1969. I was in the office working with estimators and. Uh, on some of these big projects and uh, we managed to, to secure a couple of them. Um, and one of them was um, the Kemp Place Tunnel. Uh, in the same week we won the Ross River Dam up in Townsville and uh, 
the boss wanted to send me there. And uh, when he told me, he saw the look on my face and I, he said, you got a problem? I said, well, not a big problem, but I've just signed, signed on with Winner Manly on a contract to play football. And, and being the sportsman that he was, he said, well, okay, well, we'll send you to Kent Place. So it was as simple as that. So I went to Kent Place in 1971 and then uh, spent a couple of years there. Um, moved over to the, so that was the infrastructure side of Leighton. Then I moved over to the uh, subdivisional side of Leighton and had a short stint out at Centenary, Hooker Centenary, before going to the Gold Coast. They sent me to the Gold Coast to uh, uh, look after um, the Hooker Rex works on the Gold Coast in 1972-73. Uh, in 1973, Leighton nearly collapsed uh, and uh, they retrenched a lot of people, uh, which was very sad. Uh, the boss called me in the office and he said, um, I've spoken to uh, the uh, managing director, who was a bloke called Stuart Wallace at the time, and uh, uh, we're going to keep you on. Are you able to change your course from part-time to full-time. And I said, I'm pretty sure I can. But I said, uh, don't forget, boss, I've got two kids. So, you know, <laughs> I've got to be paid. So long story short, uh, I started full-time. I uh, got a few exemptions from what I'd done, but not a lot, um, because I went from an associate diploma to a degree. And uh, um, so I started and... Um, Denise reminds me, we had a lot of stews in those days. Uh, um, of course, we had the two kids. Well, Scott was born when I was in, in 74 when, uh, when I was there. And uh, uh, I was earning as much as the lecturers. So Leighton's looked after me, there's no doubt about that. And, uh, and uh, in return, I didn't have holidays. I used to work through the holidays and uh, at Christmas and, and whenever they had breaks. Um, but anyhow, after a couple of years, I'd advanced. Not as well as I'd like to have it, but uh, I advanced through and, uh, and the boss just said to me one day, he said, um, so how long have you got to finish? I said, well, I've got a full year and then at least some more. And he said, uh, I said, why? And he said, well, I'm, uh, I'm looking for someone to go to the Gold Coast. I said, well, that's me. <laughs> it was quick as that. And uh, so I went to the coast and uh, we based ourselves at uh, Pacific Fair. We just won that job. Uh, the shopping centre there, and uh, I looked after that. The uh, all the Hooker Rex works at all the canal estates down there, and also Sir Bruce Small, uh, his canal estates at the uh, back of uh, Sorrento. So uh, away we went, and uh, uh, and I was there till uh, sort of around 1976, 77, and uh, um, things started to dry up a bit. And uh, they uh, made me the, uh, the sort of front runner, the, uh, the front man in the uh, Bowen Basin area. Uh, we had some work for Utah in Dysart and Morumbah. Uh, we won work for Cap Coal, German Creek, and I was the project manager on the dam there where the town of Middlemount uh, now resides. And uh, I found myself still involved with the coast but spending, um, you know, three weeks away, sometimes in camps, and then home for a weekend and away again. And I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I was doing my job, but I wasn't enjoying it that much. And then um, Leighton's made the decision that they no longer wanted to participate in uh, the subdivision or lower end of the market. And uh, I saw an opportunity and grasped it. Correct me if I'm wrong, that was in around about 1979 when you left the business. They were only chasing work above 200,000, I think. Is that, is that the yeah. case? And you saw an opportunity to, to go and chase that lower value work that they no longer wanted to do. Talk us through the, the genesis of BMD Group. How did it all come about in 1979 alongside your, your family members and, and Denise and, um, and your sister Beverly and, and her partner as well? Well, Bevan, uh, had, uh, who had got me the job at Leighton's in the first place, who was instrumental in getting me the job there, he'd, uh, he'd left Leighton uh, uh, in about 1977 
and uh, he set up his own little business uh, with backhoes and trucks uh, and uh, was, was doing quite well. Um, when I decided to, uh, to have a crack on my own, um, I went and saw the Hooker Rex manager at the time and uh, I said, uh, um, I'd like to price that next job you got down here. And he said, well, you just told me that you're not interested in, uh, and I said, no, no, not Leighton's, this is me. And uh, it sort of, he was taken aback a bit and uh, had to check with Sydney, uh, the head office, and uh, he came back and said, okay. He said, but, uh, you know, don't let me down sort of thing. And uh, um, we won the first job I priced, a uh, job at Burley Waters. Uh, it was about 187000 I recall. Uh, in today's terms, you're probably talking, you know, uh, five million, I guess. I guess. Um, and uh, then I had the problem was, so I won the job before I left Leighton. And uh, so I had to resign and, and then it was just me and I thought, well, I haven't even got a foreman. So um, my last job on, on the last day was I sacked the foreman that I had on the job. <laughs> and he didn't want to take the sack. Uh, so I had to go home with him that night and convince his wife, which I did. And uh, Bobby Smith, employee number one, uh, he retired after 34 years with us and uh, uh, never looked back. Just before we move on, I think I read you launched the business with 12,000 in a redundancy payout or a, a superannuation payout, it might have been, from Leeton's. Well, Leighton's, how, how did you get through that first 12 months? Um, I guess one of the things that was remarkable when you look back now, and, and, and I give big credit to Denise, uh, our mortgage that we took out in 1971 for $14,000 to buy our first house, and I had two years full-time at uni where I, I dropped back to about, you know, probably about two-thirds of what I was earning when I was full-time working. Uh, we repaid that loan in six years. And uh, the interest rates went to 21%. We started off at about 11, and uh, the interest rates went to 21%. So, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we obviously did have a lot of stews, and uh, uh, I was still fortunate that Leighton's, even when I was at uni, provided fuel and a and, uh, car allowance to me, as well as paying for me while I was at uni. So, um, um, yeah, they were tough times, but uh, very rewarding in that uh, um, we were able to uh, uh, pay off our, uh, our uh, mortgage. Um, so we had the, the $12,000 as a, a stake for starting the business. I was very fortunate that uh, I had great relationships with some of the major suppliers and uh, none of them blinked when I said, it's no longer me at Leighton's, it's me at BMD. Uh, I never gave private, I never ever gave uh, uh, any um, uh, private guarantees, personal guarantees. They never asked for it. And so, uh, you know, it was just like, Nothing had stopped. We just carried on as, in a, as a different name. And uh, uh, it was a tough year because in May of that year, uh, of the first year we were in business, we had the, uh, the worst flooding uh, and rains uh, in decades. And uh, we, uh, we really struggled where one of the jobs was on, on a quite steep grade was, was almost washed away. And uh, fortunately, uh, I, I'd taken out insurance and uh, contractors all risk insurance and the excess was $100. So all of that damage was done uh, on insurance. And I guess that probably saved BMD from going out the door in the first year. Um, and uh, even with that, 
the first year we turned over 600,000 and we made nothing. And, uh, uh, but we paid everybody. And uh, um, I wasn't that happy about that. And I won't say that was the reason why uh, my sister and brother-in-law decided to uh, call it quits, but um, uh, he was doing really well. I appreciated the fact that he'd given us a start again and, uh, and we, we, we parted totally amicably and, uh, uh, and uh, we, we still continued to use him uh, as plant hires and trucks and things like that when we, when we uh, parted ways. Scott, I might bring yourself in here. I read that from the age of about five or so, you were accompanying Mick to building sites right across Brisbane and that the, the business was ever present in those formative years. Perhaps to begin, take us through sort of the early period of your life and the influence that your father and your mum and, and the business more generally had on those years. Yeah, as, as you sort of heard, you know, family businesses can be somewhat all encompassing and and everyone's chipping in. So there was always activity around the house, you know, um, for a period of time at the office, um, originally working from home, but ultimately from an office just down the road from where we lived. So, um, you know, we'd, we'd pop in there most afternoons after school and engage with the guys working with, with dad and delivering projects. So it was all kind of exciting, you know, there's always stuff happening. Um, as I said, on weekends, We'd get around with dad to the jobs and, and see what we're doing as a young kid, you know, big earth moving equipment and it's kind of exciting. Uh, in our school holidays, my grandparents um, used to take us on the pay runs. Every Thursday they used to deliver the pay packets to all the boys on the site. Back in the days where they still hand out, you know, cash in envelopes every week. So we'd get around the jobs on, in Brisbane and the Gold Coast and it was, it was a great, you know, great time um, to see what was happening and exciting. You know, every job's different. Um, meeting lots of different sorts of people and they were always great to us as kids in, you know, saying day and letting us know what was happening in the place. So it, it really just generated a bit of an interest for me in, in what was happening in the business. You've previously said that all the way through your schooling you always had a focus, always wanted to be a civil, civil engineer. Walk us through the exposure that you had to the BMD group during the sort of, you know, those teenage years and to what extent did that help shape the decision to want to become a civil engineer? Yeah, well, I think, you know, like a lot of young kids, you look up to your dad, right? And, and certainly for me, you know, I wanted to be like my dad. So that was sort of the starting point, having had that exposure, seeing the jobs and being out and about. So, so very early on, I thought, you know, it's something I want to do and I want to be involved in. And I think you know, for a lot of people, and, and I've got lots of friends and, and even people within my own family who didn't have that same clarity, you know, who didn't know what they wanted to do. And it, it just made that that much easier for me to get through school knowing what I wanted to do and, and really gave me a purpose for driving through the subjects I did and, and, and the way I went about it. So, um, you know, I, I was really clear that I wanted to work in the business um, and because I was excited by it, you know, I, I, there was something that interested me and, and the business was growing all the time and, you know, there was always lots of opportunity there. So I was, I was very keen to pursue that. You completed your studies in around about 1995, I, th I think I recall and you had a discussion with Mick whether to go out and work for an external firm or whether to join the business straight away. When you did join the business, uh, I read that it had, I think, 50 million in, in revenue and about 150 staff. What was the, the company's model at the time and how did you begin to see its sort of operations start to expand during the, the late 90s? Yeah, so that, so that was a really important time in the business, that early 90s. And um, so, you know, with lots of family business, I'm sure they have the same conversation about, you know, family coming into the business as, a, as to whether it's the right thing to do, whether she go somewhere else and bring other experiences um, into, the, into the family business. But it was growing. We're in a period of significant growth at that point in time. And, um, you know, 12 months prior, so in 94, we'd expanded into North Queensland. Um, so, uh, you know, there was opportunities emerging as we grew our footprint geographically and expand our client base. So, you know, Hooker Rex was our pr predominant client over that first sort of 10 plus years of the business. And we'd started working with developers like Delphin and Stockland. And through those relationships, they'd opened up opportunities in North Queensland. So when I came into the business, um, you know, very quickly, we secured a project in North Queensland in Cairns was the largest contract BMD had ever secured, which was an $11 million canal subdivision in, in North Queensland. And uh, 
You know, we won it on the Friday and on the Monday I was in the ute on my way to North Queensland. So, um, but it was a great time and, and being up in North Queensland, um, part of what was a really strong team of guys working away, provided a great opportunity for me to get away from, you know, we'd been established in South East Queensland at that point in time for you know, 15 plus years. Um, and, you know, we were very well established. We had all our supply chains established, all our suppliers, subbies, um, and I had people, you know, we went to Cairns and literally opened the phone book and went to, you know, E for excavator and, and rang around to try and find the gear we needed. So to be part of opening up a new region um, was a great opportunity for me to really get into the work that we did and uh, get some great experience working away from home and family. Um, it was a good life experience in that amongst a really strong team of people from within the business. So it was a really exciting time. I, I think it's important to note, sorry, I think it's important to note that um, the negotiations around him starting work with us uh, were, were all his way because uh, I had a notion that he, he should go and work elsewhere uh, because he'd, he'd done so well at uni, he got the Dean's Prize and uh, he had a lot of job offers. And uh, albeit they were in more in the consulting field than the contracting field, um, but I felt that it would have been desirable for him to go elsewhere. And I think that was one of the reasons when we decided, okay, he's intent on starting with us, but it won't be with me. And that's when he, he was sent further afield. <laughs> Despite your, uh, your sort of surname being, you know, as part of the business, or, or in your case, Mick, your, your first name being part of the business, no favours or no special handouts. You started as a graduate engineer and, and had to work your way up. What was that experience? That was it, mate, yeah. So I started the ground up and, and really learnt the business. So from there, um, yeah, working away, as I said, building. So we're in a new region, so we didn't have a established supply chain and, and you learn a lot about how you go about building projects. And, you know, at, at that point in time in North Queensland, everything still came from Brisbane, so you had to be very organised. Uh, if you forgot the bolts or the, you know, the, the pit cover, it was going to be three or four days to get it. So uh, the teams on the ground very quickly remind you of some of those things if you get them wrong. So a great learning experience. And certainly when I look back on it now, it was a really important period in, in my career just to be um, given some opportunities to work away. And, mm -hmm. and the autonomy um, and the empowerment that comes with working in a region on your own, not obviously on your own, but with a team, but away from room head office was a great experience. Mick, I want to ask you about that sort of first 20 years in business from 1979 until 1999. You were able to build a business from, well, it was just yourself and, and your sister and, and one other to a business that was, you know, growing exponentially right across Queensland. How were you able to do that in a practical sense? You know, how are you able to, to work out what the fundamentals are for that level of growth consistently year on year? Well, I'd be... Telling little porky pies if I said it was all, uh, uh, you know, strategy and man and uh, I knew where we were heading with all this, but it was it was more uh, trial and error, uh, I guess. And uh, uh, we were very fortunate that uh, uh, I'd engaged in what I call um, uh, relationship contracting, and uh, I was very focused on on delivery. Uh, to the client at the highest level and uh, um, what we did in those days uh, with, the, with the, the crew of people that I had, uh, I don't think has been replicated and uh, it sounds very boastful but, but honestly what we were doing uh, on subdivisions in those days, uh, uh, you don't see it today and that's not a, a criticism, I think it's just uh, there's been so many different parameters that have been added in uh, that, that uh, delay the projects from be, the, being completed like we did in those early days. Uh, and um, uh, efficiency uh, on the project is, uh, has gone out the window compared to what we were doing. It was like, um, people find this hard to believe, but you know, in the centenary suburbs of Brisbane where we were working on, say, four or five fronts in different areas, you know, River Hills, Mount Omni, 
uh, Middle Park, all these different suburbs within the centenary estates. And you're building um, 40 to 50 lot subdivisions, generally in sandstone. We were completing those projects in six to seven weeks from go to woe. And, uh, you know, it's unheard of. It was like a sausage factory. And, uh, but paramount to what we were doing was the quality of what we were doing and uh, delivering for our client. And I think that, to answer your question, that's what, what uh, really was the foundation behind uh, what we were doing. Uh, we did 23 years straight without going to tender with the Hooker Corporation. Imagine that today. I mean, the people that we deal with in the, in the property industry today, they couldn't get their head around that because everybody seems to be wanting to go back to tender and it's all about price. They seem to think that it's all about price. It's not all about price. It's about relationships and it's about um, people uh, doing the right thing and uh, building up. Uh, you know, you can build a momentum. Uh, so nowadays we find we get asked when, when things are red hot, that's when we come into our own where, you know, they want someone that can build something in a hurry. We still have that reputation, I think. Segways well into that relationship aspect of business. What have been the, the keys to developing relationships that you've learned over the years? How have you been able to instill the power of relationships in the business? And then yourself, obviously, Scott, as well, how have you been able to carry that through over the past four decades plus? Yeah, well, I think I think uh, performance, our know, performance, you know, enhanced our ability to, to continue to build on those relationships. And uh, sounds a bit corny, but in those days, uh, um, you know, our clients accepted that everybody's got to make a bit of, bit of money. Everybody's going to make a quid, right? Uh, and you don't have to screw, screw the subbies to death or, in our case, screw the head contractor to death to get an outcome. And I think that's one of the issues we've got, particularly in the building industry today, is that, that uh, you know, the margins are so slim that uh, they're destroying any incentive. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we've just built on, built on those relationships uh, and that generated the cash flows, very important. Um, cash flow in any business is, is critical, pretty simple. And uh, we, we also um, had a relationship whereby if, if you had a touch of the shorts, you could go to the client and say, any chance of getting an advance? And it happened. Um, and and it, it worked for us as well. If some of our plant hires or, or whatever came to us and said, we need a, a, an advance, we were able to do it. And uh, that general sort of relationship not just with us, with the client, but our subbies to us, you know, made for very, very uh, efficient and, uh, and happy uh, relationships. I mean, every time we put bitumen on a job, we'd have a compound party. And it got to the stage where we were putting on every day, so we had to call them off, we'd do it once a month. But, uh, you know, they were the sort of things where all the subbies and the suppliers would turn up with a carton of beer, we put on all the sausages and steaks, and and uh, give them cab charges so they could have a few beers and drive home. And, uh, you know, it just builds uh, this wonderful sort of um, camaraderie and, uh, and uh, everybody's happy. And I think whilst things have changed um, over time, it still remains an important part of our business. You know, relationships, and not just with clients, but internally, um, the relationship you've got with your people, but also the supply chain, your, your subcontractors and your supplier partners are still something that we really focus on in terms of the way we interact and engage them um, and trying to do that in a way that's different to how our competitors might engage with them so that there's an opportunity for some competitive advantage out of those relationships that allows us to you know, get the, the odd favour when we need it as, as, as Dad mentioned and, and those things are really helpful and you know, we're still relying on repeat business so for our clients you know, it's still really important in terms of getting opportunity to do the next stage. Um, in terms of making a dollar. So it's still very much a focus for us. I want to continue on that theme of your career trajectory, Scott. You 
started in the business 95 as a graduate engineer, then you became a project engineer, then you are an area manager, and then ultimately you were appointed construction manager for New South Wales a decade or so later in 2005. How did you see or how do you see your progression through BMD over the years? Yeah, I, I think I was, well, well construction business, um, you go where the work is, right? So, so there was always that aspect to the geographic movement and moving um, around initially Queensland and ultimately to New South Wales. Um, but I was always looking for those opportunities, opportunities to progress. And I think, um, you know, being open to those opportunities was always something that um, was really important in terms of availing yourself of them, right? Um, so I was always looking for the opportunities to move around and, and do something different. Um, and through that, you know, sort of first 10 year period, I, I was given those opportunities and um, the opportunities to build my experience. And, you know, I was, I was trying to prove myself. You know, um, say because I did have the family name, I was very keen to ensure that uh, I earned those promotions and those opportunities. And then when I did those, when I was afforded those opportunities, I did those jobs well. And um, I think I largely did that. And, and through that, more and more opportunities came. So, um, but we were growing too as a business. And I think that's really important too, is that through growth, it creates opportunities. So being open to the opportunities and the opportunities being available because of the growth of the business sort of combined to allow me to move reasonably quickly through some of those earlier parts of my career. I want to talk about that growth that you touched upon there. So not only was BMD expanding uh, regionally and, and nationally across Australia with the launch of new offices and working with new clients and, and the size of the team, but also acquisitions of new businesses and launches of new businesses, including Urbex, which is the property development business uh, or sub-business of BMD Group. How did that come about? I think it was 03, I think it was launched. What, what prompted that move to not only provide services to developers, but become developers yourselves? You know, we'd had a property business, uh, effectively it was BMD Properties, um, that uh, had been ticking along, um, predominantly, I guess, uh, doing uh, subdivisions and things uh, in our own right in our backyard in the the Winner Manly district more than anything else. Um, uh, other than when we went to Melbourne and we had the, um, uh, the fortune of, uh, of, of having the Berwick, uh, Berwick Views project, um, which is a bit of a story because it was one of our um, major clients, as it turned out, um, Amex Corporation, which become Oakland now from Western Australia, had introduced us to this Berwick project. And uh, we'd previously done a joint venture with them in Brisbane, on the south side of Brisbane. Uh, and um, so we, went, we moved to Melbourne on the back of doing that 800 lot subdivision with them. Only to find out that they had a few issues uh, and, and wanted the money for elsewhere in Alice Springs, believe it or not, and uh, to this day, I remind me mate about that and he regrets it. But uh, he said to us, uh, we're, we're, we're out of this and we, but the good news is we brought Australand in uh, to replace us as, as your partner. I thought, well, this will be interesting. Like this is our major client. Uh, and the bloke called Brendan Crotty was running the show at that stage. And uh, anyhow, long story short, Brendan said to me one day, he said, Mick, he said, we'll drive you absolutely nuts in a joint venture. Um, you know, I don't think it's gonna work. So he was angling that uh, they would take us out. Right? So I surprised him and said, well, okay, well, we'll take you out, <laughs> which is what happened. And uh, we took them out and uh, um, we brought in a, a, a Gold Coast uh, based uh, company called Villa World. Uh, which was their first foray out of out of uh, South East Queensland, which uh, sent them on a national uh, path. So, so all in all, that was a wonderful uh, outcome, I guess. Um, but uh, the property business was sort of ticking along, and uh, we'd done a joint venture with. Um, uh, it happened to be in the centenary suburbs of Brisbane with uh, a company called um, Urban Pacific which was owned by Macquarie. 
and uh, it was quite successful. Uh, and the team that we dealt with there were uh, um, a little unhappy and uh, we spoke to them uh, and they were all based in Adelaide. Uh, three people uh, were based in Adelaide. One was an accountant, one was an architect and the other was the sort of general manager. Uh, anyhow, uh, we employed the three of them uh, on their condition that they convinced me that they could operate our national property business from Adelaide. And effectively they did for quite a long time. And uh, during that time they were looking after projects in Darwin, projects in Cairns, Townsville, uh, and, um, and um, uh, in particular the first one we really did is, is still going today in, in Townsville um, called uh, Kalinda Chaste with the um, Lancini family, uh, hugely successful and uh, um, the Urbex brand was born on the back of that, that was their that was their uh, idea, the Urbex name, and uh, we maintained it. Scott, I think you led Urbex for three or four years prior to becoming Group Executive Director of Operations and then more recently CEO of the business. So you've got first-hand experience with, with that division of the business. What, what were or what is the methodology behind sort of evaluating developments and whether it's a JV partner or whether it's a, a new project, what do you and the team look for? Yeah, well, I mean, we had a philosophy around being this sort of one-stop shop and we saw it as a competitive advantage. And, and at the time, several years earlier, we'd established a small in-house engineering design consultancy. So with the, uh, the property group, the engineering consultancy and the construction capability, we saw that as representing a significant competitive advantage. So I guess um, the priority for Urbex was around you know, driving that efficiency and utilising that as a competitive advantage to grow our footprint. So um, you know, we looked primarily, obviously every Urbex project, we looked at the dynamics of it as a pure property play, but then also prioritised opportunities that complemented our construction footprint. So you know, at the time we were growing markets in Sydney and Melbourne, so we, we looked for opportunities in those markets where we could offer our complete suite of services and provide a competitive advantage. Um, you know, working in joint ventures is something we've, we've always done a lot of, um, particularly in the property space, and um, you know, the opportunity to offer our services to a wider number of projects through sharing um, some of the equity in those projects with other partners allowed us to do more. So it, it opened up more opportunity for our construction and consulting businesses to offer those services to a broader uh, base of clients and projects. So that was really how we thought about growing um, the property business and it supporting the growth of our ancillary businesses at the time as well. I want to ask you about the BMD business as a whole. I think I read this correctly that 40% of the revenue or 40% of the size of the business is still based out of Queensland, but obviously there's been enormous growth over the past two decades. Uh, you've also expanded internationally into the Philippines in, in 2017. What, what are the considerations that are made internally prior to deploying capital or saying, okay, we're going to open an office in Victoria or New South Wales or Western Australia, or whatever the case may be? Yeah, look, I think we always had a, as a strategy, geographic diversification as a key pillar. Um, you know, particularly having grown up in Queensland and particularly having moved into North Queensland as our sort of initial growth path into regional Queensland, uh, we were subject to the sort of seasonal variances that you get in Queensland, right? So you got three or four months of the year where it's hard to get stuff done. So we always had a period of time in the year when we were Queensland centric where it got really tight, you know, from cash and, and managing that through that wet season. So the opportunity to have a stronger geographic footprint was something that we were particularly focused on in terms of trying to balance out our cash flows. So, you know, the, the southern winters tend to be a bit wetter um, and the southern summers are pretty dry. So you had the, the strongest months in the southern region coincided with the weaker months in the northern region. So that was always the thinking around our sort of geographic expansion. But the way we went about it was different for every region. Um, say in our initial early days, we grew on the back of the relationships with the likes of Delphin um, property group who were one of the largest developers in Australia. So we supported them in 
you know, Townsville and Cairns and across to Darwin, into Melbourne, together with the work we were doing at Berwick, we were working with Delphin in, in Melbourne. Um, and Sydney. And Sydney, Holroyd Gardens. Um, but then, you know, we were given the opportunity to acquire a business in Sydney through our relationship with Australand, um, Walker Civil Engineering, when they acquired the Walker Group. Um, so we took on the civil operations there. Um, so that was a different approach. So where we'd generally been organic in our growth, we'd actually made an acquisition in, in, in New South Wales. Um, and then when it came more recently to somewhere like Western Australia, um, you know, it was a market again to sort of strengthen our geographic footprint we were interested in. But we had a key manager within the business who, for personal reasons, wanted to move to WA. So they had the opportunity to support um, a very competent and capable operator who wanted to be in a new market um, was one that we saw some value in, so we supported that. So there's been different reasons for, or different approaches to each of the markets. Um, some of them have delivered results quicker or, or easier than others, but um, for the most part, all of them have achieved ultimately the objective. I think it's important to uh, reflect on, particularly the Sydney uh, acquisition, which was um, very instrumental in, in uh, I guess, creating the situation uh, for Scott, because um, we drove, he and I drove to uh, Sydney in uh, January of 2001 for him to be sort of um, middle management in, uh, in Sydney. And uh, at that point in time, I had no intention of, of uh, uh, moving down to Sydney as I did. But uh, long story short, um, uh, the acquisition wasn't all that it appeared to be and uh, caused us a lot of heartache. Uh, me in particular, because uh, we found a lot of staff that um, we'd inherited that uh, weren't up to the job. And um, I think I could count on one hand the number of people that I'd terminated, uh, you know, in the previous sort of 20 odd years. And I found myself looking down the barrel of, of, uh, of um, sacking 40 to 50 people. And that happened. So Scott was no longer middle management because when I started sacking, I started sacking from the top. So um, uh, we found Scott um, ended up in, the, in a very senior role and uh, Denise and I moved to Sydney for 18 months or so uh, and lived in Piermont. Um, and uh, we had Dare as well down there and uh, he, was, he was helping out. Uh, um, he was struggling with his uh, arts and, and film and television, so he needed a job and, uh, and he willingly, much as he didn't like it, uh, helped us out in Sydney, uh, you know, with payroll and dockets and, and uh, cost control, everything. Um, so, so Scott became the construction manager, New South Wales, as you said earlier, and uh, I guess in simple terms, he, 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 because of the circumstances, had become very hard-nosed uh, because it was a tough job. So um, we decided about the uh, uh, graduate management course at Harvard, which he undertook. It was only six months, wasn't it, or three months? Or yeah. But during that time, one of the lecturers, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, identified that... Um, Scott would be a really good candidate for MIT and uh, introduced him to the dean there and, uh, and he, he, he ended up doing the Sloan. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was a really, so it was a challenging period work-wise and I, I certainly learnt a lot about myself but a, a lot about running a business. So up until that point in time, everything, everything had been about success, right? Growing, everything was successful. And then we had a period of real adversity in, in running a business and, and stumping up to the, you know, the board every month with results that were less than, you know, uh, something to be proud of. So, you know, it was a really tough period of time. You know, so fortunately, mum and dad came down and, and really got involved in helping to sort that out. And uh, so I learned a lot about what I didn't know about running business, which then sort of led to a discussion about, well, maybe there's a good opportunity to go and do a bit more study and learn a bit more about general management and, and business and, 
And that was the opportunity to go to um, Harvard initially and then across to MIT where I did my MBA. And as your dad said, you were uh, accepted into the Sloan School of Management to do the MBA, one of the most prestigious business schools, not just uh, in America, but, but globally. Take us through, so you're, you're learning on the job uh, and you're learning the practical sort of business experiences and management experiences on the job, but then also you're learning the theoretical component at, uh, at MIT. How did those two sort of mesh together and how have you been able to use some of those learnings as, as CEO of the company today? Yeah, look, I think it is important to take some time to step back and look on some of these things. I mean, at the time, say when I was in Sydney, uh, it was really challenging and daunting, but, but I did, it certainly identified areas where I needed to know more and that provided a bit of a, a catalyst for me to want to learn more. Um, so then when you go to somewhere like um, you know, Harvard and MIT, they're tremendous places to learn, but the group of people is really, the, who you learn from is, is the cohort and the group of people you're working with. And um, again, there was a life experience for, for Kelly and I to step away from um, the day-to-day -day running of the business here and to get two years in the States immersed amongst a group of people who are all in similar situations on trajectories within their organisations. Um, to have the opportunity to share our experiences and, and, and share learnings on, on uh, and build networks. So I think, you know, one of the things that I look back on now is I've got a tremendous network of contacts in different industries across the world who I still call on and we still touch base and, and talk about how we're doing and what's going on. And just having those people um, outside of your sort of day-to-day -day network to, to talk to and, and, and share experiences with is something that's pretty valuable. Um, as a leader in a business. So that, that, that those sorts of things, I mean, you know, the technical learning, I think you, ne you need to learn what questions to ask rather than, uh, you know, technical learning in these programs, right? I mean, you, yes, you do some accounting, yes, you do some economics, but I'm far from an accountant or an economist, right? But I know enough now to know that I need to ask the right questions of the right people. So I think they're the sorts of things you learn in those programs. I think they really help. I want to ask you both uh, about succession planning within the business, something that a lot of family businesses throughout Australia and, and throughout the world uh, have struggled with over the years. How have you been able to manage the dynamic between yourself where you're, you're now chairman of the business, Mick, and, and your CEO, Scott? How, how have you been able to manage that so seamlessly where, where others have struggled? You, well, maybe Scott will have a different uh, uh, view to I, but uh, uh, I mean, we didn't really ever discuss that in great depth. It was always there and I think uh, there was a certain sort of um, uh, understanding that we'd, we'd like to see these things happen and uh, if it happens, that'll be great. If it doesn't happen, well, that's probably be good too in some ways. But um, uh, yeah, it was something that was never ever discussed at great length. I can honestly say that. And uh, uh, but I guess my expectation was, as I saw, uh, you know, the evolution of uh, of Scott's uh, career, that uh, he certainly it was obvious that he. He had what it uh, what it takes, and uh, you've also got to be conscious of of uh, the other people in the business, the other staff. You don't want to destroy their ambitions. So it wasn't something, as I say, that we were shoving down everybody's throat. That you know, Scott's the heir apparent, or or uh, because he had to earn his own stripes, as he said, uh, which is why um, you know until we went to Sydney. Uh, he'd, he'd, he'd never worked closely with me at all. It was only when we got to Sydney to, that that started to evolve. And uh, then he was away for a couple of years and came back and he came back to Queensland. And uh, that's when it sort of all started to gel. Yeah, so I guess when I came back from the States was when we started to get more involved in working closer together. I, I came onto the board at that point in time, initially just as an observer, to sit in on board meetings and and, and see that sort of machinations of, of how the board operated from a different perspective to what you know, I'd obviously previously 
through the construction business had, had reported through to the board, um, but to actually sit in on the board meetings and, and just be involved in a wider discussion around what was happening in the group was was a great experience. But yeah, I mean, it was something that I'd always I'd always aspired to. Um, and you know, coming back to Brisbane, um, you know, was when those opportunities started to to open up that um, it was something that was going to be possible. And um, you know, you can see in my CV when I was moved into sort of operations manager role, that's a role I was in for a, a long period of time. And I think um, that was really important. And it wasn't it wasn't something that happened quickly. Um, that transition and that sort of handover to my current role happened over, you know, throughout that sort of tenure in my previous role. Um, and as we got to the back end of that, of course, we had some really difficult periods through that point in time, you know. Um, so I came back from the States in 2007, so then we sort of headed into the GFC um, and the challenges that it presented, um, which also coincided again with a real period of growth for BMD. Um, on the back of the sort of resources boom and, and things were booming in Queensland in the back end of uh, sort of the 2007 through 2010. Um, so then we had the challenges of the GFC that they presented um, and then sort of later as we moved into, um, you know, the period. So GF, the GFC for us didn't really hit until a few years after the sort of, you know, I think the GFC occurred in 2008, which was a time where we had record levels of work in hand. It was only as that work sort of fell off that we started to see the real impacts and our inability to replace that work. And, um, you know, that presented a period of some challenges. And again, um, I think you never work harder than when things are tough, but you also learn a lot in that period of time. And I think that provided, again, the catalyst to, to step forward and, and, and really towards a handover. I think I think that period of time, the GFC, was the first real crisis that we'd uh, encountered. Uh, when when Hooker, um, when the Hooker demise came about in 1989 through George Herskew, uh, the the situation was we were owed a million dollars, which was one full month's, we were turning over about 12 million a year, one full month's uh, revenue we didn't get. Now, um, I couldn't say at the time, because we were about to celebrate a 10 year celebration for a business, which I was going to proceed with, but one of my mentors, the bloke that employed me at Leighton's who had joined us, David Young, said, you can't do that, Mick, you know, you, you can't, uh, can't have a big party like that uh, with, the, with this million dollars hanging out there and, uh, you know, so, so I, I bowed to his better judgment. But um, um, the reality was we were doing sufficiently well at that point in time that the, the million dollars out of our business didn't really impact us. Uh, and what it did was, was set us on a course of enormous growth from 90 to 95, where we, we went from doing 12 million a year to sort of 60 million a year uh, in a short space of time, as Scott said. Um, but the GFC was something different. The GFC, uh, we found out who our friends were. And for the first time ever, I had banks questioning me and I guess my abilities to, to manage a business, uh, uh, you know, at that point in time it was turning over probably six or seven hundred million or something. Um, and uh, that really hit home to me, you know, and uh, you realise what what people have been telling you all your life that, you know, you've got to be careful with the banks, you know, they're, they're fair weather sailors and all these things that we'd never encountered. Um, and uh, fortunately, just prior to the GFC, we'd, we'd been uh, approached by one of the major banks uh, with, a, with a plan that, uh, that uh, demonstrated uh, on our numbers that we were undergeared substantially, that 
our 200 million level of debt should be more like 350. Uh, fortunately, I didn't take them up on that. Uh, you know, as what happened with the GSC would have um, would have really made it very difficult. But but through that time, we repaid that debt, repaid that 200 million dollar debt down to nothing. Uh, and uh, you know, there was a lot of hard work and a lot of soul searching. And that's when I don't think we lost anybody. I think our staff. That's when the loyalty factor really came to the fore, and I think uh, uh, I think we were well, certainly we were very proud of our staff and the way they uh, conducted themselves and performed through that through that very difficult period. You've spoken about long-term relationships. What about company culture? How did you build such a strong and formidable company culture, and then how have you been able to carry on that legacy? I think it all came about uh, from. From uh, you know, Dad was my dad was was a was a, a brilliant man manager. Um, and in his role at uh, General Motors, he had something like a thousand people that reported to him on the assembly line, and he'd done every one of those jobs. And uh, uh, he was very fit for his age, so you know he could jump in and and help these blokes out on the line if they got behind, even in his sixties. And uh, uh, but I think that you know, observing him and uh, the work hard, play hard side of, side of things, plus, plus uh, you know, Dad used to always say, these blokes don't work for you, they work with you. You know, that's something that I love to, uh, to repeat. Uh, and I think that's a very important part of uh, building a, a strong relationship and, uh, and culture that... Uh, that is, um, you know, has some longevity when you when you're trying to, uh, you know, perform at the highest levels. Well, I think in the early days, obviously everyone was handpicked um, because of their you know, personal attributes that sort of resonated with with Dad in picking them as people that he wanted to work with. And obviously, as we've grown, that gets harder and harder. But um, you know, we've really tried to instill what those attributes were that made BMD special or different. And um, we talk about the BMD way a lot in the business now that really tries to capture what those values were that, that drove the way we worked with each other, the way we worked with our clients. Um, and so that's a really big focus for us now in terms of trying to pass those messages on um, within the business. Um, you know, we've got a 20 year club um, that's got over 100 members now and, and those 100 plus people are really strong custodians of the culture of the business and, and we really focus on that group as a key group to try and drive you know, the, the culture that we're still very proud of. I mean, ultimately, you know, we deliver the same sorts of projects as our peers. We need to do it differently, other, otherwise why would people choose to work with us? Because um, we certainly don't want it to be just about the lowest price because that doesn't take you a long way. So that's still a really big focus for us. And I think you know, we're also very much focused on developing within, developing people within and promoting from within um, as, a, as a key because our culture is so important. We want people to grow within that culture and, and, and know what it is to be you know, a, a representative of BMD. And you're both going to a function this afternoon to attend a 25 year celebration of, of the Melbourne office uh, being in operation. Not a lot of companies would cel A, celebrate that or B, have you know, senior members of, of the family and the, and the management team going down to actually attend those functions. What do they mean to staff? And then how much does that sort of carry the legacy forward for people that will become members of the 20, 30, 40 year club in, in future, do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, Mick spoke earlier about, um, you know, the, the sort of compound parties when we had all these major achievements and celebrating milestones is an important part of the culture, right? We, we ask our people to work really hard and they do work really hard. Um, and it's important that you take a bit of time to reflect on that hard work and you acknowledge that hard work. So I guess, um, you know, these sorts of events we're celebrating tonight are just a little bit of just acknowledging the hard work that's gone into from not only those people that are there now, but the people who've been there across that journey. And, um, you know, we'll take time with some of our clients and, and, and a lot of our staff tonight to just, you know, have a bit of fun and, and, and celebrate some of those achievements over that period of time, which is important. 
I thought we'd close out with a few questions to, to finish. Mick, from your perspective, been in business for coming up to 45 years now, what have been the fundamentals for success? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a that's a big question. Um, uh, I'll repeat what I said a little earlier. I, I, this wasn't the plan. You know, I didn't uh, I didn't have this vision when I started the business uh, with Denise uh, and my sister and brother-in-law many many years ago. It was more a lifestyle change for me that. Uh, uh, to, uh, to spend more time with the family. Uh, and uh, um, that hasn't always translated into what I wanted to be uh, and what I wanted to do because uh, I found myself going back to the old ways of working, you know, seven days a week and in the early days and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. But it was at least, uh, you know, you're doing it for yourself uh, and, uh, and the family and for the generations to come. So uh, I think we've always, uh, the success comes from, from um, a desire and achieving, achieving that, uh, the desires to, 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 to produce at the highest level, to do a good job. I really believe that. I really believe that, that uh, Myself and, 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 and all of the staff that, uh, that we've accumulated along the way, particularly in the early days, were um, very proud. It wasn't just, you know, building a road or, or something else, a bridge. It, it was something that we actually were very proud of. And uh, uh, as, as you heard from Scott, you know, on the weekends we'd go around and and uh, have a look at these things, have a look at the old projects. I still do it. Go back to some of the old projects and see how they're faring, you know, see if the road's still standing up and, and uh, I haven't seen any failures yet. But um, uh, yeah, it's a difficult question. I mean, I don't think there's any, any real uh, single or, or a few numbers of, uh, of, of points that can say, if you want to succeed in business, this is what you got to do. You know, I think it's a, I think it's a it's a, a multitude of uh, uh, situations, and uh, uh, I do believe you take your opportunities when they present. That's definitely something you've got to do, and be forthright and bold in that regard. But uh, by the same token, if you find you're up, you know, Shitters Creek without a a paddle, you've got to be smart enough to say, okay, we've got to change direction, back off and go a different way. So, you know, there's a lot of things you've got to do and a lot of, we all make mistakes. Um, if we had our time over again, we'd probably do some things a little differently in some arenas. But I think it's, it's important to note that also that in, in the first 20, nearly 30 years, of BMD, we didn't have a bad debt. Never had a bad debt. People couldn't believe that. We, you know. And uh, you know, when you when you're doing the job and getting paid, that helps. Scott, from your perspective, I mean, where do you want to take this business? The foundations are so strong, five divisions, 2,000 staff, as I mentioned, revenue, I think last financial year in excess of one and a half billion dollars. A lot of people would have sold out to private equity or would have sold out to one of these big global conglomerates. Others would have listed it. You guys have remained private. Why is, why is that the case? And where do you see the business in the next 10 or 20 years? I think Dad touched on it a little bit there. I mean, there is enormous satisfaction comes from achieving things and delivering things. Um, but also, you know, opportunity and being open to opportunity. Um, we've got lots of really good people who, who we want to see succeed and, you know, their success is our success. Um, it's not without its challenges as a private group, the size that we are and funding growth is challenging. But I think, um, you know, we're really focused as a business on creating opportunities for people 
you know, very, you know, we talk about our business being our people and, and as much as it sounds a bit cliche, um, it's something that does drive the way we think about what we're doing is you know, where, where are the next opportunities for our people? We've got these great people doing a great job. You know, what is the next opportunity for them? And in that, you know, that drives you towards uh, being open to opportunities for growth. Um, and again, as, as Dad said earlier, you know, did he think 44 years ago that we'd be operating in the UK or the Philippines like we are now? And even 10 years ago, you know, they weren't necessarily things that were high on our radar, but they were opportunities that presented at a time where we had some really good people who were keen to avail themselves of those opportunities. So for us, it's a relatively simple um, step for us to take to support those people and say, absolutely, you know, we will back you and support you to, to pursue those opportunities. So, you know, I, I think we're in a really um, interesting period within the group. You know, we're in a period of growth, um, you know, record turnover this year, um, just gone, we'll achieve another record turnover um, this coming financial year. And we want to use the success in this period to really catapult the business forward for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, we can see parts of the Australian market that have been really critical to the growth we've achieved over the last several years tightening. Um, so I guess we're always interested in trying to find markets and opportunities where there's a bit more margin and a bit more opportunity to, to make a quid, which ultimately is what we're still about. Um, so, you know, in, in looking further afield, you know, we are interested in going offshore and leveraging our really good people and and the really strong brand and capability experience we've built over 40 years um, to avail and, and to open up opportunities. So, you know, I really see the next five years being about setting the business up for the next 15. And, you know, don't, you know, you never say never with regards to this conversation about, you know, why haven't you listed? Do you want to list? Um, it becomes challenging and, and it puts pressures on the family at times. Um, you know, if things get a little bit more challenging or decisions we need to make about how we support um, some, particularly as, as we move into some large opportunities. Um, but, you know, we've, we've generally, and, and mum and dad and family have generally been supportive of supporting the growth of BMD. And, um, you know, whilst that's the case, then we'll continue to pursue it. And, and whilst we continue to deliver good results, I'm sure we'll enjoy that support. So, you know, I think the future for BMD looks pretty bright in terms of um, what the future holds. Global domination um, could be on the cards, but we won't get ahead of ourselves, you know, one step at a time and say back our good people to deliver good results. Nothing would surprise me. Just don't swing it on me. <laughs> but it's interesting, like, uh, we've always said uh, that, um, you know, when BMD does well, uh, we want our staff to do well too. But, you know, the simple philosophy that, that we've always tried to adhere to and it becomes, you know, a bonus or, or, or something, you know, uh, is if we're doing well, well, we want the people that helped us get to that situation to enjoy some joy from it as well. And that includes right down to the tea lady or the whoever that gets a, you know, $200 voucher for Christmas and see the joy that's in their face when they're, you know, it's just a little bit of Christmas joy or something. Someone, so everybody gets something, you know. Final question uh, for you both. You've both got a lot of interests outside of business. Uh, Mick, you're on board or have been on the board of the Brisbane Lions Football Club, South Bank Corporation, Greg Norman Golf Foundation and Queensland Life Saving Foundation, of which I know you're, you're very proud of and that you donate a lot of time and, and resources to. What drives your, your interest in contributing outside of the work that you do with, with BMD Group? Well, I guess it's, um, uh, you know, the community sort of, uh, um, I see it as a, as a sort of way of giving back to the community. Um, I'm very proud of the, uh, of the uh, Bayside area and the Winter Manly area where, where I grew up and, and uh, obviously it started there where we, we try to be very generous. And I think that's translated all around Australia, we encourage, uh, we're a little bit different because we've got that urban model as well as the infrastructure, uh, whereas a lot of the big companies will move into a, an area, say, say it's Townsville, and while well, they build a big project and then they move out. 
when we move in, we take the whole model in. We like to take the whole, uh, you know, the whole diverse uh, host of companies that BNB have uh, under our umbrella. And yeah, I, you know, I think you know the community is such an important part of civil construction. You know, it has the ability to be very disruptive to people's lives. So there's a need for some goodwill with the community and one of the ways we can generate a bit of goodwill is just by being active and supporting the community. So, you know, we certainly, as, as Dad said, you know, we really encourage our teams to, to work with the communities, whether it be volunteering their time to support different causes or financially supporting events. We see it as an important part of allowing us to do what we do best with, with a bit of support from the community because of the support we provide to them. Mick Power, AM Chairman of the BMD Group, and Scott Power, son, Chief Executive Officer of the BMD Group. Thanks so much for your time and for sharing your insights as part of our series. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.